Hey everybody, and welcome to the very first video of 2023. And as we have done the last two years, I am joined by none other than Kurt and Alan, two pretty well-known people in the industry. And we are going to be talking about what is up in data, at least what we think is going to happen in data in the coming year. If you're interested in the last two videos from the last two years, I will have those linked down below. And of course, these are just our own predictions. So if you have your own predictions, make sure you link them down below so we can see what you think is in store for data for this year. All right, so with all that said, let's go get started. Talk Talking about things that are going on in data, I mean, there's so much stuff going on, first of all, like every time I turn around, somebody is now talking about, you know, the chat bots. I it, actually, this happened just last night. I was talking to somebody um, or no, I overheard. He was a, uh, a guy that works at like a substation or something in the city of Boston. And I overheard him talking uh, to this other guy who's a salesman um, and they were talking about, oh, did you hear about this, this computer AI thing? It can write like a human now. And I think that <laughs> that is a big deal. Not to say like, you know, the, the chat GPT three stuff is, I think overblown first of all. Yep. Right. There's a lot of other models out there like it, but I think what makes it remarkable is the average Joe on the street is now talking about AI like they never did before and not talking about it like, you know, in the movies, like real stuff that they can go and, and experiment with, which I think is really amazing. I think that's actually going to start to change the narrative a little bit on what AI is and is not. And I think it also raises a lot of ethical concerns <laughs> and helps people understand how things are are uh, taught in the AI space. That's that's kind of the, the the area that I think people are like regular people that don't do AI or data. I think that's something that's going to pop up a lot more this next year. The thing about the chat GPT stuff is that it is, I, I saw it, I actually had a chance to play with it fairly extensively for my very first thought is, man, this is going to change everything. <laughs> um, it is, it, it really is, you know, you have to understand my, my household is basically, you know, we've got two, three writers because my daughter is a writer as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, uh, as a writer, I'm going, oh crap, <laughs> this is <laughs> not a good thing. Uh, but you know, the, the interesting thing that I saw with it was that it was very, very good at being able to produce answers. Now, were those answers necessarily accurate? Not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I had, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a good example of this was that someone posed a question and said, okay, uh, you know, when I was six years old, my sister was three years old. Now I'm 70 years old. How is, How old is my sister in the, the chatbot responded, oh, I'm 73, or she's 73, <laughs> as opposed to 67. So, you know, the, the reality is that, okay, no, it's not completely correct. What's scary about it is that it is almost correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, and, and in the fact that it was basically able to take something and take a common word problem and utilize that to be able to get an answer that you might expect from someone who isn't necessarily an expert, but is learning about something to give you. Um, yeah. And that was kind of scary. But all because the other models that are like of its ilk, right? Like Lambda. Yeah. I did a video on on how the, the Lambda model works on, on my yeah. channel. And it is remarkable how I think it's it's not necessarily fact-based anymore, right? Like we are used to that now because of like yeah. things like Google and you know Alexa and other things where you ask a question, it gives you an answer. It's like great, we have an answer. But to have a conversation, right, which is basically what how you're writing, right, you're creating a narrative, is jumping to different topics in a cohesive manner, right? Yeah. So I think that that's the part that is truly remarkable when you are a human, you have this whole backstory, right, that 
that nobody knows about. Like when you're writing, you have all your characters have this backstory and you don't know anything about that until it kind of starts to come out from the writing. So if I'm talking about, you know, I, I'm really excited to, to go to this concert and then I say, you know, but, and I remember when my dad taught me how to play the guitar, why did I make that leap in logic, right? Like there's something about music made me think about the guitar. And then me as a human had that experience and now, now I'm sharing it. That I think that, that kind of cohesiveness and jumping around to different topics. Uh, that's, that's where I think that all of these models, not just the one that's the most popular at the moment. I think yeah. that's where that maturity is starting to show and getting really exciting. Yeah. And let me just put a bit of context in, in what you just said there. Ashley, and just sort of building on what Kurt was saying. Um, I don't know if you've read Tom Nichols' book, The Death of Expertise, yeah. but um, mm -hmm. the first thing I thought of when I started reading about chat GPT-3 or whatever, chat, chat GTP <laughs> or whatever it's called, um, is, okay, this is going to be very useful, but it has to be useful in, in a human in the loop scenario yes. where mm -hmm. you've got curation and you've got somebody basically editing what comes out of it, or it could be useful in other scenarios, but you'd have to be very careful how it's used. And, and so what you're going to see is this Pandora's box opening and all of this semi understandable, semi uh, sometimes accurate, sometimes not information and, and we're just going to be swimming in it. Yeah. Um, and so social media is going to uh, really amplify that. And you're going to find the bots just generating all this crap. And, and, and Steve Bannon's going to be very happy. Uh, <laughs> cause he, because he wants to just flood the, uh, the channels, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that that's, that's a big part of it too, right? Is not just the ethics and other things, but the the mindset of, I think, a lot of folks that don't know much about AI is that it thinks on its own. And that's, that's the sentiment I hear the most uh, right now, if you look at any popular media or talk to, you know, your, your, your mom or your grandma <laughs> about this, is they're like, oh, the machines are starting to think. Um, like us. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's not. We're just getting better um, at, at training and, and making logic out of the reams and reams and reams of, of data that's out there. But I think what, what you said, Alan, is, is so important here, which is human in the loop. Humans are not cut out of this situation. It is, we have to continue to make better data sets. We have to make sure that those are ethically done, that they are covering uh, more languages. Because Try asking some of those questions to any of these models in other languages and you'll see where they fall short. That's where we have to continue to, to grow because, you know, if we are starting to see real application of these chatbots, we have to start to, to think about the data sets that are supplying them, right? So if it's being trained on all the social media, we've seen where that can go wrong, right? I think that um, those those early models that we saw like being trained on Twitter and how hateful it got <laughs> very quickly shows what real humans are like, right? Like mm -hmm. Kurt, you said, you know, the chat isn't the the facts, the writing isn't all correct. Yeah, welcome to being human. <laughs> right? We're not very correct all the time either, and right. and that's what's well, really ironic to, about all this. To 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 kind of take that a little bit further. You know, we tend to think as humans that we're rational mm -hmm. and we're not, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those scary things about the fact that, yes, you know, if you think about the fact that most humans basically do follow specific patterns, uh, albeit very complex ones, um, when talking about or when, when we're using language. Uh, and the fact that it is those patterns and not necessarily facts themselves mm -hmm. that are basically what drive this whole process. Um, you know, we have to be very careful of distinguishing, distinguishing between um, the ability to converse and the ability to be factually mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. 
And how do you um, define a fact? I mean, and, and, you ask. yes, <laughs> and and, th and these are hard questions. These are questions that that experts of language, journalists, mm -hmm. um, you know, others have been asking for decades now. Um, you know, when you when you stop and think about the fact that for well, the fact there, there we go. When you stop and think about we learn about the world primarily through secondary channels. We do not learn about the world through um, you know, what we directly observe or mm -hmm. what we confirm. We we basically have a fairly complex set of filters that um develop networks of trust and, um, you know, determination specifically of what constitutes correct or truthful mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of network, that kind of training is something that's so intrinsic to us that we don't really even think about it yeah. until we get to a point where we're staring at something like ChatGPT yeah. and going, okay, this is actually talking close enough to the way that a human being talks, mm -hmm. that in fact, it is going to be sensitive to data, but so are people. Yeah. Um, but something else before we move on, um, Kurt, that you, you mentioned, I think it's important to just note that a lot of these um, generative models are also not live models, meaning you are not, the models are not regularly getting updated with new facts, new understandings and things from whichever data sets they're getting. So that's also important to note because as we as humans develop our, our learnings as, as humanity, the models might not be keeping up to speed because it's very expensive to do so. So that's another point to just be aware of. Other aspects of this and how it could potentially be useful and, and somebody shared a really useful set of links about uh, uh, the 2023 market outlook. Mm -hmm. So all the uh, investment research reports that you'll see at the end of the year mm -hmm. uh, for, the next, for the coming year. Um, there's just uh, link after link from all of these, mm -hmm. all, all these uh, research units of these companies. And, and so I was thinking, okay, if we could crowdsource using that and get mm -hmm. to a consensus forecast mm -hmm. just by processing those reports, then we could, we could really um, triangulate in a, in a, in a much more efficient fashion, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, and, and I think that um, there are some companies that are doing this kind of thing. O'Reilly a few years ago was looking at these AI um, uh, mentions and mm -hmm. doing a forecast based on that. Mm -hmm. And lots and lots of data mentions about AI and content and, and some pretty interesting projections and prognostications came out of that kind of report. And you just have to take it for what it's worth. It's, it, you know, it, 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 you take it with a grain of salt or, or two um, <laughs> when you're looking at that stuff. But, but it, well, it that's what people are open utility. about what they're working on, too. Right. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. A, a huge part of it is there's so many. I have seen the amount of job postings out there for confidential skyrocket this last year. And, you know, we know that a lot of the venture capital stuff is, is drying up for startups and things, but it makes me wonder like why that shift, or maybe I'm just um, paying attention to it a little bit more, but there are so many more, um, you know, job postings that are coming in where people are hiding that they're starting to work on these things. So yeah, crowdsourcing, but good luck trying to get uh, some of the big players to share what they're doing. <laughs> Well, I, yeah. I think you know, there's there's a couple of things there. You know, for, for starters, you know that's that's Malcolm uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I think is the mm -hmm. um, you know the, with the tipping point. They also had another another one uh, a little bit more recently um, talking about uh, consensus models and, and how um, you know what you're talking about are things like Markov chains, mm -hmm. Drucker's walk. Um, in terms of of hitting that point where you can basically say, okay, I've got a large number of people essentially cloud uh, uh, 
crowdsourcing um, this process of determining a set of information. And surprisingly, it is accurate. It, uh, statistically, it is accurate more often than it's not, you know, mm -hmm. given, given everything else. And a, a big part of that is the fact that you are effectively taking a, um, a number of disparate vectors of and you are then taking from that disparate, those, those vectors, you're essentially um, doing the same process that ironically you would do with machine learning of effectively saying, what does the curve look like for all of these vectors to be able to find essentially the information that you have out there? And so by that process, what you're doing is you're creating local minima Mm -hmm. that essentially allow you to say, according to what is known by a sufficiently large number of people, oh, um, it's triangulation. this seems to be the it's triangulation, yeah. but it's triangulation over a large data set. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, One thing that I think is going to, to be a trend that we're going to see more and more of is things like the mechanical Turks, right? where people, I think, are going to, there, there's already people that make a pretty decent income in being a reviewer and an annotator for name your AI project, right? And I think because we are now ingesting so much more um, for these, these large language models, that area is just going to continue to grow. And so it might actually become a full-time job for some people. I, I think that that's kind of where we're heading in some of these directions with, if you have certain life expertise, right? Like maybe you're a psychology major and you know, you know, X, Y, and Z, therefore you are more of a subject better expert in, in this kind of, of modeling that, that we're looking at, or these annotations that we're looking at. Having those human annotators is, so, again, you have to worry about the fairness and the biases and all of that. But I do think that that's going to continue to grow and more and more people are going to get into it. So it's, it's almost like I wonder if this is the new evolution of the indexer taxonomist role, which, you know, having a lot of that in my background, I see, unfortunately, a lot of companies, those are some of the first jobs to be let go, which sucks. And I think it's mostly because companies don't always understand what they do. But this is maybe the, the reincarnation of, of those same skill sets because it's, I am a subject matter expert. I understand how information and how language works. And then I can annotate so that the machine models get better and better and better. So I do think that there might be um, a space that that is moving into. Yeah. And I was just thinking that maybe we should be front loading this stuff. Mm. And what I mean by that is if you look at the beginning of the data life cycle, and, and you think about the data that we're collecting, uh, we do a poor job of it. And, and just oh, grabbing content, content uh, without really uh, enriching it at the front end yeah. mm -hmm. is, is just, it's a du duplicative way of doing things. Sometimes it's never refined mm -hmm. and people are trying to, to do sentiment analysis or something on it. Um, you know, it's just frustrating. As somebody who spent a lot of years on the collection side of things, there is so much we could do to to make this rich content that is mineable up front. Absolutely. And, and there are models we can use for that purpose. I mean, wonderful models. And the thing is that the best models have not really been discovered or we're not agreeing on what those best models <laughs> are or how yep. to put them together at different levels of abstraction and, and build yeah. something larger with them mm -hmm. as you know we talk a lot about data but but um we're there's no commitment on the front end there. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm just trying to get people interested in 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 tracking provenance for example yeah. and 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 really just uh building a, a means of of explicit provenance so that we're not having to deal with uncertainties mm -hmm. when we get the data. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you know, it, it really ties back to um, provincial IT 
and uh, then the the personal computer and and how balkanized things have been since then <laughs> and and how we didn't really build from scratch this whole um data provenance capability yeah and and uh, we we put applications before the data and the data is is so um it it's it's not tangible in terms of results that mm. people don't get interested in it. I, I rather... love that too, by the way, Alan, like, I think that that's a theme that, that is, you know, throughout this whole conversation, which is, I think the focus is now going to be switching from the application to the actual data, right? Because there has been a, a pathway of broken dreams and, and, and data redundancies and grossness behind every application. And I think that now that we're looking at using the full data sets in many cases uh, for, you know, again, large language models or whatever we're talking about, that's where it's going to come to bite you, right? If you got a bunch yeah. of gross data and you don't know where it came from or talking about provenance, Alan, I, I think that, you know, I was, I just got done with my honest review series for the winter. And one thing that, you know, kept coming up in a lot of those um, reviews and, and even past reviews is, if you, whether you go RDF or property graph, doesn't matter, you are creating this beautiful model and then you get an update. <laughs> and then you're like, oh crap, what updates did I make? Where, how, what, you know, and you got to redo it all if you don't have that provenance, right? Like if you have that provenance, you're not starting from scratch every time you have to do something new with your data. And I think, again, it's because you're not going with the application first mentality. You know, the mega trends uh, are, are this way. Um, and, and like Kurt said, uh, humans aren't always logical. So there's some emotion mm -hmm. tied up in this too. So mm -hmm. there's going to be some of my own bias in what I'm saying. But uh, there is a trend toward decoupling and decentralization. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so uh, part of the impetus for this, uh, it, this has been going on since the, the dawn of computing, but the most recent impetus, impetus has been that people need to own their own data or yeah. control at least the most sensitive aspects of their or data. Or at least be educated on it. I think that's step right. one. Right, exactly. So... So there's um, there's the ability to decouple the storage, and uh, the ability to to um, do on device matching, for example, mm -hmm. so that you're not you're not duplicating the data. Mm -hmm. You're just using it in place um, f when it when it comes to sensitive things like biometrics. Yeah, and and so. Um, it's really, it was startling a few years ago when I was researching blockchain, I got invited to uh, a startup's uh, gathering and the CTO invited me and I didn't know anything about the company. So I go to this big conference room at a law firm in Palo Alto and, and um, I was just startled to see all these people who were sitting around the table talking about investing seven figures of money each in this in this venture and um they were talking about advertising during the super bowl and all sorts of ridiculous things <laughs> and they were talking about getting users to put their biometrics on their blockchain and and I was my, my jaw just dropped and and when I got my a word in edgeway wise I basically described what I was was really so appalled at yeah and and after that session I, I wrote the law firm and I said you know this is your client and you really have to think about uh <laughs> how damaging this could be yeah. um in terms of your reputation, among other things, and and so that that company disappeared, like many of them do. But yeah. um, it, we have a window of opportunity right now because um, the uh, the cryptocurrency aspect of this is so um, down in the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> so I do think yeah. that you've got this this all these de decoupling initiatives and solid is one of them that 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 have power and the challenge is how do you explain them to 
to people in an easy way. You can do very similar things with Discord. And, you know, I, I run a Discord server and I'm, I'm looking hmm. at running a Mastodon server. And I'm looking at both of these in comparison to where we are with Solid. And I'm thinking of Solid is missing the boat because it's basically it's basically saying, OK, yes, you have to have graph primacy. You do. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think there's any question of that. Mm -hmm. But the question does does become realistically is the graph primacy as important as the ability to essentially say we have protocols for communication across mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. distributed nodes. Yeah. And some of those nodes can basically be graph nodes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you if you think about this and this evolution now of of all of these distributed federated Mastodon servers going out there. And I'm just thinking, man, you know, if you can piggyback on top of something like that, then for all intents and purposes, you're building out this network. You're basically building out solid. That's a very solid. geeky thing though, uh, right? Like, I, and that's, and, and I, I, I want to hear from Alan on this too, because Alan, I know you are very, very into the like personal knowledge graph space uh, plug for Alan and his working group that <laughs> Has stuff going on that I've I have yes. been a part of a few times, um, but that I think is is what I have a problem with with both what what Alan said and with what Kurt said. I am a hundred percent like let's get into the personal knowledge graph space. People should own and understand who is using their data and what it's being used for a hundred percent. However. With both of the things you just described, solid and you know things with Macedon and you know basically being your own dungeon master, <laughs> some people will get that reference. That is a very geeky thing. Like my grandma down the street is not going to be able to do that. So how do we make it? Or is it is that even the goal? Is the goal to make this widely used, like the internet, or are we still okay with it just being in pockets? I, I think that you, you put your finger on something, which is, okay, solid itself might not be the the example to point to ultimately, mm. mm -hmm. but it's it's an indicator of a trend. You know, I think the, uh, the challenge that the open source folks have had for eons, and I'm including Tim Berners-Lee in that group, <laughs> um, is that you, you just don't have the user experience to, to yeah. do what you're talking about, Ashley. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wanted to do with the working group was to get some UX people in the group and get uh, like a critical mass of folks who are UX designer friendly folks mm -hmm. who understand the graph stuff as well so that we can actually build better UXs for the products that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and and right now the case is that the uh, the venture capitalists are funding those those uh, user experiences. I, I, yeah. That's my impression without having mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. omniscient uh, mm -hmm. view of it. Like the whole reason half of these things are being used so prevalently by the average person is because. They're entertaining, they're easy to use, right? Which is the UI component, but then there's the pleasability personalization aspect, right? Which is all the algorithm stuff. Yeah. And that's you know, why you're seeing all the all this network networked mm -hmm. uh, note taking, all these silos popping yeah. up. Uh, that aren't really solving the big um, yeah, exactly. federation problem that we're mm -hmm. all really here in, in on this call, we're concerned with. Maybe it's not the consumer that 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 comes up with the um uh, with a solution to this, maybe it's maybe it's the enterprise, and mm -hmm. and and maybe it's um, the ability to write apps on this abstraction layer that that all of a sudden you're you're focusing more on the data and um, you're managing at that data layer level, mm -hmm. and you're doing more with the data to make it analytics ready, machine learning ready, and um, you know, navigable and searchable and discoverable. One point I'd make is that we talk about upper ontologies, but do we really have them? And that goes to to <laughs> no, Kurt's no. point that that there are these um, there is this uh, method of of actually being even more abstract, so that you're you're categorizing the things like like ordered lists that Kurt is talking about. So 
somebody who's been working on this kind of thing, and I'm not making any promises about the effectiveness of it, sure. is is Greg Sharp, mm -hmm. who is uh, a family physician. Mm -hmm. You you may have seen some of his talks, and he has this uh, fixed schema called ADAPT, mm -hmm. and and so he's somebody that really comes from the relational world. Mm -hmm. um, he's not really thinking in terms of solving things for graph people per se, although he joins any number of, of graph meetups. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that his, his point is let he's got maybe 40, 46 different cells in a matrix that, that he's using to characterize things at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And, and he's well informed because he, has read so much logic and philosophy over the years. I mean, he knows more about Whitehead than than I ever could could know about Whitehead, <laughs> and and so he's made this comparison and contrast, and and has extracted the the the, the necessary um, logical takeaways to be able to come up with this fixed schema, mm -hmm. and and. I think it's a very promising idea and he just needs people to interact with yeah. to, to, to um, flesh it out and, and make it so that others can grab onto it and, and help him do something with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example. So mm -hmm. the other example is, is relational AI, mm -hmm. which you, mm -hmm. you may have heard of before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Moham Arif is the CEO they are trying to build windows into the data so that different roles inside the organization can see the data their way. Uh, there was one other I did an honest review of recently this last year, and I, the, the name escapes me right now, but they were doing something similar where it was like views tailored to the, the end user or role that was looking at it. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot depends on the plumbing that's underneath it. Um, yeah. And and so they've got a, what they're claiming to be a very highly performant database mm -hmm. that that uh, supports all of this. And um, they're calling it relational. I mean, you know, tables are not whatever the structure is underneath it. They're, they've abstracted beyond that. To, to Kurt's big point, which is, OK, the user or the the you know, the end uh organization needs to be the one doing the transforming. I couldn't agree more with that yeah. statement. I, I just think that we've been going through this frustration with um, organization, uh, you know, uh, vendor imposed data models. And, <laughs> and, and that is still trapping us in this, in this purgatory that we can't get past. People are getting really yeah. sick of it. <laughs> like, oh, but I have this very unique, special use case. Yes. All yes, you do. And, and okay. so does everybody else. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, that's that's why ontologies exist, because yeah. everybody is special. Um, <laughs> Everyone is special. <laughs> that's you why know, they call I, it snowflake. I, I yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's why they call it snowflake. Everybody <laughs> is special. Um, and realistically, that means that you are responsible for the representation that you maintain to the outside world, to your in internal users for this particular unique aspect. Once we have it, then the transformation process is something that we can effectively automate, but it's going to be automated largely on the basis of, of if I have X and Y and there is some broker uh, A uh, that sits there and, and is able to say, hey, look, X and Y, I have three or four transformations. Once I have that, I can give you a best estimate of what you are seeing over here to be able to say what you're over here. And I think that's as close as we're ever going to be able to get. One, one parting remark, um, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about you know, this metaverse and all this other stuff. I, I just saw this ridiculous number that McKinsey put out about how much the metaverse is going to make someday. But one thing I, I think that I, I'm starting to pick up on, it's, it's a little subtle. So maybe it's, it's early days, right? So, so prediction is 10 years from now or something. But I don't think it's necessarily like this crazy weird metaverse that Zuckerberg has <laughs> Has talked about. I don't think anyone's really interested in that, honestly. Um, it's like very dystopian on that side. But 
But what I do think might ha be happening, there is the generation right now that is, you know, 10, 12 ish years old, that is coming up through the age that they have all the data in front of them from infancy, right? Like it's, it's in their faces constantly. And there is already studies showing that more of that generation is getting as, as, as silly as it might sound, because I mean, they're all using TikTok and stuff too, is they're going to get burned out way faster on technology than the rest of us have. And so there's going to be a getting back to nature and grassroots and getting rid of technology moment. But again, like we're not getting rid of technology. We're not ending this, this, um, this talk on, oh, all technology is going out the window. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is I do think that because we are so hardcore on this right now that the younger generations are going to get burned out on it very quickly um, because there's so much of it now and it's constantly changing. And now we're losing trust in all the things that we have. And maybe rightly so, because they've been doing this weird stuff to us as guinea pigs for so long. And now we're just figuring it out. But I think that, you know, the, the metaverse thing, it's probably going to be more like augmented, right? Where it's, it's helpful. You walk around in nature and you want to figure out, can I eat that plant? Or is this one going to make me break out in hives? Like that kind of thing. You walk around and, you know, not going back to the Google Glass um, era or, or like the is, who is it? Is, is, oh, I'm not trying to find some weird brain thing to, to implant. Not saying any of that's going to happen either, but I do think that more and more people are going to want to be out in the real world, especially because of all the lockdown stuff that we've all just lived through. I think it's going to be a weird, interesting amalgamation of getting back to grassroots, not being on your computer constantly, but also having it still kind of part of your life, but in an unobtrusive way. So I do kind of see that as a trend that is starting to kind of pick up a little bit um, and one that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about. So that's that's kind of my my closing remarks on some of this is we're all still, you know, going to have jobs in 10 years. This is not, you know, all the data stuff we're talking about is not going away. But I do feel like the ways that we're thinking about technology are going to be changing um, rapidly in the next few years.